going to start. And seconds. Hey, Curtis. Oopsie. Just wondering. Good catch. That won't do much. Okay. You can roll. Is that on? Nope. Well, sure. Everything's under control. <laughs> Got to turn things on. Usually help. We're here for the Avengers, right? I guess Trout Avengers, if that's what you're into. I don't know that I have any superhero stuff Super, to bring in, but... Superpowers? But, uh... Hopefully I can get you as close as I, we can with the fly rod anyway. So are we going to watch a rom-com while we're here? Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. We are on screen. Hey. Okay, okay, you roll with it, man. All right, so thanks for coming out tonight, you guys, and thanks for the YouTube crowd for joining in. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about my new book. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a dive into it. Uh, the book is called Tactical Fly Fishing, Lessons Learned from Competition for All Anglers. And really what it boils down to is for the last, I think it's been 13 years now, that um, I've been competing with uh, Fly Fishing Team USA. Uh, along with uh, Lance Egan, who is somewhere here in the shop tonight, uh, schmoozing with others. Um, and uh, we've had a, a really great uh, bunch of experiences, including this was in Bosnia back in 2015 when we won our first uh, team medal. We got silver that year, and I got the bronze individually. Um, so that was a highlight, obviously. There's the medal ceremony right there. Um, and some medals, those are always fun. Uh, then this was uh, the next year in 2016 when Lance won the bronze individually and we got the bronze as a team as well. And then just for a little flavor, this is uh, this last year in 2018 in Italy uh, with a really cool fountain in, in this town square that they had the opening ceremonies in and a really cool cathedral that was back there that we got to go look through as well. But uh, anyway, when it comes down to, to fly fishing competitions, uh, we kind of have what I, ha I call the three-hour dilemma. So it's not like a normal day out for most of us, I would imagine, where you can choose where you want to go and, and fish kind of whatever water you want, assuming you know there aren't a whole bunch of people already in the water that you're trying to target. In competitions, we, we draw what's called a, a beat, which is essentially just a, a piece of water that's 80 to a couple hundred yards long, depending upon the tournament. Um, and we have to fish within the boundaries of that beat for three hours. And we get that randomly drawn. We can't choose which water that is. We just show up to the river, and whatever beat we draw is the beat we draw. Um, so we have 30 minutes once we get there to look at the water, scout it, and rig our rods and decide what strategy we're going to use or strategies we're going to use to cover that water and try and maximize the number of fish from that beat. Um, so the question I always pose to people Think about it if you were in that same situation. I know lots of, you know, most people don't have the, the desire to compete, and that's totally fine, but um, a lot of people would like to have a more successful day on the water. So the, the question is, if your goal is to catch as many fish from a beat or the river in front of you as you could, how would you fish that water? So that's the question that's always going through a competitor's mind when they see the water for the first time. Are you doing this as a team or just as individuals? This is as an individual once you hit the water. Every individual on the team gets their own special water. Correct. Yep. So, um, think about all the different water types that are available to, out there to fish as well. So this was a piece of water on the Vlatava River in the Czech Republic. They call this the Devil Stones. This was the top of, of the Devil Stones, and it got even more devilly as you got down in there with uh, boulders that were the size of Volkswagen Beetles that were throughout the beat that I had there. Uh, so compare that then to most of you will recognize this piece of water on the lower Provo. 
uh, just below the river hole. So, you know, very different water type here, but still has a lot of fish. Uh, but you might choose to fish that a little bit differently than you would that piece of brawling pocket water in, the, um, in that last photo. Um, or here's the uh, Orava River in uh, Slovenia, or Slovakia, sorry, that we, were, we fished in 2017. So much different water yet, yet again, just kind of a long, medium depth glide. Uh, not a lot of features to it. And on top of it, it was muddy when I got there and we were fishing it. Um, so different strategies there. Again, here's uh, the Piplingdal Selva River in Norway. So once again, some brawling pocket water. How would you fish that compared to that, that glide in the last photo? Uh, you might do things a little bit differently. And then here's a small freestone stream with uh, kind of a fast ripple on the left side and a little bit of uh, a gentler ripple on the right side. And we're actually going to talk about this one in a case study later. Um, yet again, different water. You might need a different approach. So um, this is the way that I see when I'm out fishing and, and the way that I used to do it myself, frankly, before I started competing. Uh, this is how I see most anglers cover water. Number one is the what I call the what worked last time approach. And so you show up to the river and you fish the same stretch of water repeatedly because that's where I caught fish last time and that's what worked last time, so that's where I'm going to go again, right? You, you, you go back to your confidence areas, uh, a piece of water where you know you can catch fish. Uh, you might have a rig or a style of fishing that usually seems to work there, so you keep going back to the same stretch. And a uh, the bulk of the time, you might fish the same flies as well, because that's what worked last time, right? So keep it up. Um, then there's the cherry picking. First chapter, and it's all about making a plan based on observation. Uh, we're not going to really cover that in this presentation much tonight. There's a whole bunch of uh, theory as well as some practice in that chapter on things that I ask myself when I look at new water and variables that I observe and how I go about my, uh, you know, strategizing and making a plan for that water based on those. Uh, some questions that I do tend to ask are, what is the water clarity? Uh, can I see fish? If I can see fish, I might want to you know, uh, try some sort of sight fishing approach. Um, is there an active insect hatch? So uh, Lance and I were out a couple days ago on Monday, and uh, when we got to the river, there were already a few fish rising. So we, you know, we made some uh, adjustments throughout the day as, as we saw fish rise to then, of course, target fish that were you know, taking advantage of, of a midge hatch. Um, so obviously that's something to keep in mind as you're, not just when you get to the river, but throughout the day, make that continual observation of whether there's a hatch or not. Um, are there rising fish? If there are, maybe you should try, you know, some sort of dry fly or in the film approach. Uh, what species of fish are in the river? This is often one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but makes a big difference. Uh, if you happen to be fishing a river that has only brown trout, you might look for the fish in some different places than if you were fishing a river that has only rainbow trout, or if you had them both together in the same river. If, if that's the case, you're typically, typically going to find the rainbows in deeper and or faster water, um, closer to higher velocity currents where they can maximize their energy intake, 
whereas the brown trout might be hugging banks and looking more for cover and energy conservation rather than maximum energy uptake. So keeping in mind the species you're fishing for can also lead a, a little bit uh, to picking better water types to fish at any given time. And then lastly, I think the most important one though, uh, other than the insect hatch, is what is the water temperature. So here's a little clip from our film Modern Nymphing Elevated that tells you a little bit about how we adjust where we fish based on water temperature. Because trout are cold-blooded creatures, they are ruled metabolically by the water temperature that they're in. When the water is between freezing and about 40 degrees, the metabolism of the trout is extremely raw. You can certainly still catch fish very easily, but you need to focus on deep, slow water where fish are conserving energy and they're often potted up in these areas. This is this is why a lot of times during the winter you'll find a lot of fish in deeper, slower pools, and why fishing pocket water for faster ripples at this time of year is really not going to work. As the water temperature gets into the 40 to 45 degree range, sometimes you can begin to have a few hatches of betas, mayflies, or slightly larger insects. When this happens, the trout will usually still be in relation to those deeper, slower pools and deeper runs, but they might move into the heads of them take advantage of those hatches and those drifting insects a little bit more. Once you get into the 45 to 48, 49 to 50 degree range, then the trout really do start to spread out, especially if you start having them with like nymphs. You can have them in a little bit shallower water then, which moves a little bit quicker. And then once you break the 50 degree barrier and get towards the 55 degree barrier, that's when you're going to start to see trout getting into that apex of their metabolic phase, which generally trout have their highest metabolism somewhere uh, between 55 and 63 degrees, depending upon the species of trout you're targeting. If it's in that center range, then the trout will be everywhere. There will be a, a few trout in the pools and deeper runs still, but there will be a lot of trout up in really shallow, ripply water, in the pocket water, on, on the bank, anywhere from deep to shallow and in between. So because you're year nymphing, you can target all those different water types with just a few small changes. So for whatever reason, the uh, video wanted to play about a minute behind the audio there, so <laughs> you didn't see the clip as it should be. But uh, uh, and I mentioned there at the end, you know, it being about your own nymphing, that came from our second film, Modern Nymphing Elevated. But the book is about a lot, a lot more than that. I would say uh, about just kind of forming a, a tactical system to cover water. So let's let's keep going with that. Um, so this is how I think about covering water properly. So if I have sort of a mantra when I head, head to the river. The first thing that I tell myself when I get to any given spot where I think fish might be is it might be a, a single pocket that's only a couple feet wide. It could be an entire run or pool. Um, regardless, I'm going to cover back to front, near to far, and shallow to deep. Uh, so I don't shoot straight for whatever I identify as the apex spot in front of me. I'm going to work my way into that, try and get a few of those fish that might be in between uh, that water and myself, and maybe there are some in between right on the edge of where I think there might be fish. And by working my way into those, a lot of times I can get a few more of them and hopefully uh, cause a few less of them to also spook into that honey hole and maybe uh, spook some fish as well. So always uh, shallow to deep can, can mean not only just working from uh, the, like, the shallow tail out into the deepest part of the pool, but it can also uh, mean working the columns. So start with some sort of rig that is near the top of the water, or at least higher in the column, and work your way deeper. Uh, I, don't, I don't always just put on the heaviest fly and the longest tippet that I can get and get down there and dredge. I might work my way down so that I might fish a dry dropper in a spot first to, to keep some flies high in the column if there's some fish suspended, and then work my way in, into a deeper nymphing rig. Um, lots of ways to work shallow to deep when it comes to that. It also might mean going to that tail out that's shallower in the back end of a runner pool and working your way into that deeper water that's upstream. Uh, and then another way that I uh, cover water properly, I want to avoid spooking fish as much as possible. So I use obstructions like rocks, trees, uh, turbulent current to hide my presence. Um, you can break up your silhouette by putting yourself against vegetation. You can also put rocks or trees, etc., in between you and the fish. 
And uh, one thing I do a lot is look in the river, find some turbulent current. It might be some waveforms or something in the middle of the river. And I'm going to put that in between myself and the fish so that it breaks up my silhouette and I can usually get closer to fish that way without having them spooked. Um, don't just go and stand right next to a bunch of fish when it's smooth water and it's clear. If you can see the bottom clearly, the fish can probably see you. But if there's something in between, and it could just be some turbulent current that breaks up your view of the bottom, it's also going to break up their view of you. Uh, all right, so we're going to move into talking about some specific water types and how to fish them. And uh, everybody fishes pools, and I have a chapter on pools in the book, but um, I'm trying not to make this presentation go two hours long. So, so we're going to leave pools for another night. And if you want to read about uh, some case studies on pools, you can, you can find them in the book. But we're going to cover pocket water, riffles, runs, glides, and bankside lies. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take them each one at a time. We'll talk about them and look at a case study that hopefully will help you uh, understand them a little bit more. So let's talk about pocket water first. All right, so when should you fish pocket water? Now, fish can be in certain pieces of pocket water if the water is deep enough and slow enough any time of the year. But most of the time, standard pocket water, if it's, especially if it's not in relation to other pools and where they have access to some better colder winter holding water, uh, I'm going to look for trout to be in pocket water, usually in the water temperatures at least 50 degrees. But especially if you get up into that 55 to 68 degree range, then when trout are most active, they're going to be all throughout pocket water. That said, though, I've found plenty of uh, fish in pocket water just in the last week or two, mainly because some insect activity has finally picked back up. And so they'll, they'll get into that water whenever you have uh, insects hatch. Um, so where do trout hold around boulders? When we're talking about pocket water, we're talking about boulders, right? So there's basically three lies that can hold around a boulder, and it's essentially around the whole boulder. Most people think of the obvious one behind the boulder, but they don't think about that upstream... Uh, velocity cushion that's on the front face of the boulder. They also don't think about the undercuts that are on the side of the boulder. Uh, and especially when the water temperature is perfect in that prime range, I find a lot of fish on the sides of boulders where they can, it's, it's basically like an undercut on a bank, um, but in the middle of the river. And it's water that might look really fast and really turbulent. Um, and so a lot of people pass it by. But if you sneak some drifts under there, you can get some, uh, you know, a lot of times some spooky fish that have been tucked under boulders for a while uh, that you might not get any other way. And then there's obviously the classic downstream pocket. So let's look at a couple different lives here. So this is a picture of, uh, this is the Deschutes River in Oregon. Um, and here was kind of three sets of boulders. And uh, there weren't any classic downstream pockets except for the, the bottom one. The top two, they're submerged boulders. So there wasn't a classic downstream pocket below those rocks. Uh, but there were uh, some velocity cushions on the, the upstream faces of those boulders, and every single one of those spots held a fish. There were three rainbows and all on the front faces of, of those boulders, and those are spots that easily could have been walked right by, but um, if you do, you're at your own peril if you want to catch less fish, if you're going to. Uh, I normally find more fish on the front faces of the boulders in that cushion when the water temperature is better, so I don't tend to find them in that type of spot this time of year. It's usually more when the conditions are a little bit better and the insect hatches are a little bit stronger because those are more feeding lies than they are refuge lies. Then there's the sides of boulders. Um, I, uh, this, was, this shot was taken in January last year uh, in our winter with no snow. <laughs> Looks a little bit different in the same spot this year. Um, and I caught four fish in this spot when I fished through here and three of them were on the sides of boulders. Now, technically, those are also a bank side lie, but um, you know, we'll double up on that. They're also the sides of a boulder here. But they could just as easily be in the middle of the river, and you still find fish a lot of times in the same spot, as long as you have the right velocity uh, characteristics and a little seam there to hold some fish. But let's move on to the classic downstream pocket water lie. So when I look at any pocket below a boulder, this is typically what I see. Uh, think of... Uh, the letter Y, essentially, when you look at a pocket. And what I mean by that is when you look at that pocket downstream, you're going to have that really fast water that's getting forced around that boulder, and you'll see heavy seams on those. But as you move downstream from the boulder, you're going to have water peel off those seams, and they'll meet, essentially, in the convergence of the wings of the Y. So if you put that letter Y on there, 
right where the, the wings of that Y meet and merge there in the middle, you've got a convergence current. So in that spot, the currents are having a hard time deciding whether they're going downstream or going upstream into the eddy that's behind that rock. Uh, that's typically, you can, it's a turbulent spot, so you can normally identify that by just looking in the water and, and looking for boiling currents. Especially if there's a fair bit of uh, velocity in the pocket water you're fishing, you're going to see some boils right there. Now, below that, the, the currents start to coalesce and go in the same um, direction more or less together. There's still going to be some turbulence a lot of times, but they're at least mostly all going downstream. Upstream of that, the currents get sucked into the back of the rock. And so you essentially have an eddy that goes into that. So if you divide it into three locations, the eddy, and then the convergence, and then the water downstream. The water downstream is normally your, your A spot. So let's move on to this next slide here and you'll see that. So you have that slower downstream current below that, that uh, convergence spot. The convergence is right there under that red circle. That's normally not a hot spot for fish because the currents keep going back and forth and it's a hard spot for them to have a holding line and not get tossed around. Um, uh, well, you see that red circle that's overlaid on there? So that's right where the, the wings of those, that Y merged, right? And that's the convergence current. That's, that's a spot where currents are going every which way. They can be going downstream and upstream and back and forth depending upon how the hydraulics work at each second, essentially. And then you have that suction eddy behind the rock. Um, and that suction eddy at times can hold fish if there's enough depth and uh, not too much turbulence there. But in other times, it's so violent behind the rock that it just doesn't hold fish. It's normally that, that current downstream where it starts to slow down a little bit and goes in the same direction that you find fish. So what do we tend to fish in this type of spot? Um, let me just kind of illustrate why I don't fish an indicator typically in this type of spot. Um, so if you roll up on a pocket like this, and if you fish it from a, a directly downstream position, and you're tossing an indicator rig up there with, you got your strike indicator, and you might have your split shot and or, or nymphs, um, most people are going to set that up probably a little long for a pocket water type situation, because they might be coming from a pool or a, a deeper run down below. So let's say you got three or four feet, you know, in between your indicator and your fly, but you're trying to fit it all into a pocket that's only in, got a diameter of a couple feet. Well, this is what tends to happen. You get fly line that lands downstream in that, that water that you're actually trying to, to catch fish in, and it's going downstream. It's going slow, but it's going downstream. Then you have your indicator that lands somewhere in the middle. It lands kind of about where those convergence currents are. And then you have your fly that lands up in the suction eddy that's going behind the rock. So you've got currents going downstream, pulling on your fly line. If your fly line's getting pulled on, it pulls on your indicator. Your inter indicator's getting pulled, it's pulling on your fly. So Pretty much your fly is up there doing a water ski in that eddy and getting pulled downstream when it should be drifting into the back of the rock and then going in the recirc and coming around on the seam. So not a great situation for getting a dead drift um, and usually not a good situation for getting very good strike detection either, especially when you have one of the next two situations happen. So if you're at a quartering angle downstream, this is a situation that happens a lot instead. So you make your cast, your fly line still lands about in the same spot, your indicator might land in the middle, but if you uh, overshoot your target a little bit and you're casting at a diagonal, your, your fly ends up landing in that faster current that's out of the pocket. So it lands and that stuff just gets ripped downstream and basically it, it swings. And you have no strike detection because you never get tight to your, your rig. And you're also just not even showing your flies to the fish. It's going out of the pocket, uh, away from where the fish are even seeing it, and you're certainly not getting a dead drift. Um, the opposite can be true. If you land your cast a little bit short, the indicator lands on the near side in that fast current. Your fly might go where you wanted it to land, but then it, the, the fly line and the indicator landing in that faster current, it doesn't matter how much mending you try to do in this situation, even if you make a nice stack mend that pops that indicator back into the pocket, you've now lost several seconds of drift trying to reestablish that connection with your fly. And by the time that happens, the indicator and the fly is usually out of the pocket and you just cut your drift in half. Uh, so it's just not a very good rig and or technique for fishing this type of water. 
So in Pago Water, what strategies do I use? The first one <coughs> would be Euro nymphing with an up and across approach. This is kind of the standard pocket water method for most uh, competitive anglers. And a lot of times in pocket water, I'm going to use one fly so that I can provide the best uh, drift and or strike detection um, and get the most accurate placement. So if, especially if I'm fishing a smaller stream with smaller boulders and pockets that aren't as wide, I might not have the diameter of a pocket that I can fit two nymphs that are spaced a ways apart. So um, most of the time in that situation, even if I've rigged up for a two nymph rig, I'll just chop the nymph off the, the upper dropper, fish a single nymph that might be a little heavier on the point because a lot of times the fish in pocket water don't care as much about having a bigger, heavier fly. Um, they'll still eat it. And then you get really accurate placement into tight pockets and really good strike detection. Uh, in any of these situations where you're euro nymphing, uh, you can always substitute a streamer as well instead of just fishing a nymph. So you know, you can actually go back and forth if you just chop one off, put it on a rigging foam, you can put your other rig back on and, and swap back and forth pretty easily with just a, a couple of knots. So something to keep in mind there if you like to, to stream a fish. This is a great way to stream a fish pocket water as well. The other thing that I do a lot, um, especially in shallower pockets and less violent pocket water, is fish a dry drop around a urine leader. And I know you're saying to me right now, well, how's that different from that indicator rig? Why is it any better? Um, a couple of reasons. Number one, you normally have a shorter distance in between your dry and your dropper. So I'm not rigging a dropper that's three or four feet long like you might have a lot of times with an indicator in this situation. I'm keeping it short, typically only between 18 to 28 inches of, of tippet, um, hanging vertically in between my dry fly and my nymph. So uh, by having those flies closer together, you can fit them both into a lot more pockets than you can if you had your, you know, if there was an indicator rig and you had them spread a lot further part. Uh, so that eliminates some of those drag issues that I talked about in those last couple of slides. Not all, but some. And especially in slower pockets where you have kind of heavy violent seams or knife edge seams going around the pocket but a really still pocket in between. This is a great technique for pockets like that because you can just stall that whole rig in that nice slow pocket with the dry dropper even in a way that you can't with the, uh, a straight Euro nymph rig if you have tippet going diagonally across that seam. Uh, and then also, obviously, this adds the benefit of the fish eating a dry fly. So, you know, especially in the summer when you get caddis hatches and things like that, there's a lot of fish that are willing to co come up and eat, you know, a bigger dry in some pocket water, and it's always fun to see that. Not only that, but there's been times when I've had fish that are more excited about eating the dry fly than they are the dropper. When I was first playing around with dry droppers on a Euro rig, I was fishing a river um, that was close to my home at that point when I was in grad school. And all fall long, I was fishing this way up there, and there were a lot of days where I got 75% of my fish on the dry, because the fish in that river just loved to eat dry flies um, at that time of year. So it's it's a fun way to go when that happens. And you can rig two rods like I'm going to talk about, or swap back and forth and between uh, nymphing and, and dry dropper and that. Um, so a euro nymphing leader allows you to high stick that leader off the water at distance. Um, and that's why I fish dry droppers on a on a euro leader that way. So we'll run a quick little video here. We'll see if it runs correctly this time. It looks like it's going to slow down again. Let me go and test the section. I like to fish dry dropper a lot with this fish. If I come upon shallow water or smooth water, where I need to suspend my flies for a long distance, longer than I might want to float my side iron, then fishing a shallow dry dropper is great in these instances. It's also awesome with the streaming software is wreaking havoc with the video. Make it easier where you can place the rig on the back side of the, the fast scene and suspend your rig as it moves around in the eddy. Smooth pools are also a great location to try and fish dry dropper. All right, well, we'll just skip that. <laughs> If you want to see the, the good clip, turn to Modern Nymphing Elevator and you'll see it. Okay, so let's move into a case study on pocket water, all right? Um, as you can see from this photo, when we fished the stream, there was more than a little bit of pocket water. Right? This is a stream that comes out of a canyon in uh, some mountains in Wyoming, and it just tumbles the whole way. It goes from very high elevation to you know a lot lower elevation anyway in a pretty short distance, so it's just it's a pocket water fisherman's delight. 
It also meant that it really doesn't get hit that hard because there aren't a lot of people that love to fish pocket water for the whole day. Uh, but it's great water to fish. So um, let's jump straight into the second half of this case study. Uh, the, there were There's uh, a few letters here on the, the slide. Let me explain it. So if you look at letter A down in the, the bottom right corner, um, there are three numbers there, one, two, and three. Each of the numbers represents a fish that we caught out of um, the pocket water here. And if you look at letter A down in that lower right corner, you're going to see a rim of rocks down there. And that rim of rocks almost formed like an underwater check dam. So each of those spots was uh, one of those lies that I talked about where fish were holding on the upstream face of those rocks. And uh, they, they had a whole bunch of cushions that were pushing back on that current and just slowing down that current a little bit at the back end of this pocket. So in that situation, I think I, I saw a fish at, at letter number three and letter or, or, uh, number three and number two. Number one was just a blind fish, uh, fish, but I saw flashes at number three and number two. And uh, I think I caught most of those fish on a dry and, and a dropper, and several of them ate the dry fly in that spot. And a lot of times in those upstream faces of rock uh, lies in pocket water. Those are great spots to fish a dry dropper because a lot of times the fish is suspended a little bit and they're usually a lot, a lot more willing to eat dry flies than fish that are down in the middle of the pocket somewhere. So that, um, that's how I, I crept up on the back end of that one and we were just fishing from a downstream to an up, upstream position there. Once I had caught those three fish, we moved and essentially went and stood where letter A is. And now uh, we can use that turbulent current, that those waveforms that are in between um, on letter B to hide ourselves from the fish that were over in that next pocket, which is over on letter C. Uh, and you'll see that once we fished there, the, uh, we ended up changing to a straight nymph rig for most of that. The interesting thing about that day, you can see from the photo that it was quite sunny. And I think that's the main reason why a lot of the fish that we caught in this water, they weren't in the middle of the pockets if the pockets themselves were shallower. They had to be deeper pockets to get fish that were in the middle. Most of the time, the fish, fish were hugging the seams where they could get a little bit of um, kind of turbulent water over their heads to make them feel a little bit safer. So in those situations, the, the dry dropper didn't work quite as well, whereas if it, they were in the middle of the pocket, it probably worked better. But in this situation, it, uh, that wasn't the case. So we switched to straight nymphing rigs here. And Glade and I, uh, who was in the first uh, photo, my teammate, we just kind of took turns. And um, you can see the individual locations around those scenes where we caught fish. There were a couple on the, on the back end, and then one over hugging uh, at number six, where the current is quite fast, but just barely out of that fast zone. So that fish is really munching, um, getting a lot of food going by, and all it has to do is tip a fin, just dart out into the current, eat a, a food item, and then tip that fin back, and it can go right back. And then there was one fish that was in that suction eddy behind the rock. And to fish at that location, uh, the, the best way to go about it normally is to look at that eddy, find the convergence zone that I talked about in the overlay earlier, and then just make sure that your cast <coughs> is placed on the far side of the pocket, but still in the currents that are going into the recirc behind the rock. That way, you can uh, get your cast out there, hold your cider off the water to make sure it doesn't get down under anything, and those flies are going to recirc into the back end of that rock. <clears throat> and as they come towards you, then you can just uh, change the direction that you're leading your flies. You can go from leading them downstream to upstream since they're in the eddy to then going into a traditional drift as they come around and hit the near side seam and moving that rod downstream to then maintain tension again. And you can kind of fish that whole recirc on the back of the rock that way with the Euro rig, and uh, it's a really great way to do it. And then up in, in the, at the next letter there in letter D, it's a pretty similar pocket, same strategy. And what we ended up doing there, you can see. Um, over to the right of number 11, there's some more turbulent current there, and then some boulders off to the right, right at the edge of the photo, and we pretty much stood around those boulders in order to have that turbulent current in between us and the fish again, but have that over and across or up and across euro uh, strategy, which works so well in pocket water because you can keep that whole cider off of the water, and all you have going down below is straight tippet, and you get maximum strike detection that way and just a better drift. Okay, so, and then, you know, this is one of the rainbows that we caught. Pretty typical fish for pocket water like that. Uh, if 
you're in a river that has a lot of big fish, you can find some big fish in pocket water. But you know, a lot of times you're going to be finding small to medium sized fish in it unless it's just a prime pocket. But they're still a ton of fun to catch. All right, so let's talk about riffles. So riffles are, are the kitchens of rivers. And what do I mean by that? Um, the most and the largest insect prey in rivers are usually produced in riffles. And if you go read this paper by Naaman uh, and his colleagues back in 2017, um, they had a really novel way of screening off individual water types in some for forest streams to actually look at the production of, of food that was coming out of those individual water types. And it's been postulated for a long time in fisheries ecology that most of the food is coming from riffles and, and areas with medium-sized substrate and a lot of current. But they were able to conclusively demonstrate that. And not only did they find that um, those areas produce the most food, but they also produce the largest food. So if you're a trout looking to get maximum bang for your buck, you're going to want the biggest food and the most food. So riffles are a good area to go search that out. And they prov provide uh, really good feeding lies when the water is above that 50 degree mark again, once their uh, metabolic rate starts to pick up, but also when the hatches are occurring. Uh, so even right now, if you go out and there's a heavy midge hatch, you'll find some fish and riffles and once we get another few weeks into April and the beta start coming, then that's a lot of times when the fish really start to get active and into riffles. And then all throughout the summer, summer they'll be there most of the time. Uh, the best holding lies in riffles occur at depth changes. Um, so I always look for drop-offs or depressions, look for color changes that signify just a little bit of difference, and those are the, the prime locations to search within riffles. Um, when it comes to covering them, I always start by approaching that riffle from quartering downstream because they're normally shallow habitats. If you're not careful, you can spook a lot of fish in them. So I keep a low profile if I need to. And I try, uh, um, if I'm approaching from the side, I might even you know, kneel down if it's necessary, if it's really clear water. But uh, if it's turbulent or if it's turbid, you can probably approach riffles from just about anywhere and be just fine. A uh, single dry fly, a dry dropper, and or a Euro nymphing can all be good approaches in riffles. Um, and this is another situation where a single nymph can often be quite good because you get that one point of contact to your fly. Plus, if you're fishing, you know, water that's 15 inches deep and your flies are spread 20 inches apart, unless you're really leading that fly shallow or that rig shallow, uh, your dropper is going to be up in that column a little bit and probably less effective. So it's a good situation to have a single nymph, although I'm known for being lazy and not uh, chopping that off as I move in between one or the other. Uh, when it comes to, to covering them, I keep my cast as short as possible in riffles. Um, the more line you have on the water, if you're fishing a traditional method, uh, the more currents you're going to cross and the, the more drag you're going to induce. So less line is usually equals better line management, and that usually equals better drift. So get as close as you can without spooking fish, and you're going to probably catch more fish in riffles. Uh, and then when you're on anything, I always want to get tension as soon as I possibly can uh, in riffles because... Uh, they're shallow habitats. You really don't need to get your, your flies down far. And there, there are so many times when fish eat your flies the minute they hit the water in a riffle that if you're not in contact right away, you're, that fish is going to eat it, spit it out, and you won't have even known that it ate your fly. So strikes often come, come early, and that's why I always try and get tension. So uh, in order to do that, I normally make my cast, and I use that oval cast that we've talked about so many times in our videos, and I just continue that oval a quarter turn. So I make my cast, and instead of just stopping out in front, I come around in the oval, lift it a quarter turn back, and that way as my flies are turning over, my rod tip is coming back up as well, and it's putting tension on those flies. And then you can also maintain a shallower leading angle when you're fishing riffles. So this is, you know, at a 45-degree angle, from there down might be your leading angle for a Euro rig in riffles. Whereas if you're in a pool and some deeper water, you might let it get quite a bit more vertical to, to get a straight dead drift. But in, in riffles, a lot of times, you don't want to do that because your flies might tick bottom the whole way. So let's look at a quick, quick case study here. So the water, when I fished this piece of water, was uh, 58 degrees, pretty prime. doesn't get much better than that. So I expected fish just about everywhere. I actually expected them, if you look at the photo there, there's um, some dark water on the far bank with uh, some waveforms on it. And that's where I expected the best fish to be. It didn't end up panning out that way. As I was fishing this, I came up from a, a deeper run below, and I had, I think, a 2.8 millimeter bead and a 2.3 millimeter bead on, which is 
uh, I was rigged for a little bit deeper water. I probably should have changed once I got up into the shallow riffle and either went single fly or to two lighter flies, but I was lazy. And down there on the lower left, um, you can't really see it too clearly in the photo, but there's a little bit of a color change there. And if you look upstream of where I have that arc put uh, on the, the photo, you'll see that the, the rocks are just a little bit lighter tan color. And then downstream, it's just slightly darker brown. And all that was was a depression that was maybe six inches. Um, slight little lip in the riffle there. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, there might be an eight, eight or ten inch fish there. Um, and so I fished that with a couple of casts before I moved on to the deeper water that was over on the bank. And the funny part is that deeper ripple water on the bank where I thought there was going to be fish, I didn't catch them. Uh, upstream in that next little rippled slot, I caught one small fish. But that slight depression on the, the uh, right side there, away from the bank, away from any obvious cover, things like that, that produced the biggest fish and it ate on the first, like 12 inches into my first trip. And um, that was the fish that came out of that spot. So it's one of those lessons where that's water that most of us are going to walk by a lot of the time, um, especially if you can't see clearly in there and, and spot a fish. But it's worth chucking a cast in, at least a couple. Um, and be smarter than me too and be willing to make a change sometimes <laughs> because a lot of times uh, you're going to regret it after you fish it and then you kick that giant fish out of there once you walk by and move to that next piece of water. But I got lucky in this instance and that fish ate anyway. Okay, so why do depth changes, uh, why are they such magnets for fish? So think about it this way. If you're looking down on the river from a bird's eye view and you look down and you see a, a, bank, a rock protruding out from the bank, what do you see every single time? You see a suction eddy that comes behind it and uh, that water, you, you get a hard seam there and then that eddy going onto the bank and coming into the backside of the rock, right? Well, the same thing happens in the middle of the river, but we just don't think about it. So let's flip that picture upside down. Let's now think about it. We're underwater and we're actually looking across the river, okay, at the bottom of the river. And there's some rocks sticking up from the bottom. So, so now those rocks that are on the bank, instead, that's the, that's the bottom of the river, okay? There's one rock sticking up from the bottom, a little bit higher than the rest, and that forms a little void of space behind it on the downstream side, right? Well, guess what? There's an eddy that forms there too, but it forms vertically. So this is kind of a, an exaggerated case where if it was you know, a boulder in the middle of the river, it's basically that pocket water scenario. But let's you know, uh, shrink that down to some rocks that might just be basketball size or smaller or just a little shelf that drops off a few inches. The same thing is happening. You're still getting a seam there with slower current that the fish can belly up on and rest but they have all that current bringing food over the top of them. It's very easy for them to just tilt a couple fins, swim up into the current, tilt those fins back down, and they plane right back down to the bottom again with very little energy. So wherever you can find depressions, even if they're only a few inches deep, those are magnets and riffles. All right, let's move on to runs. So runs split the characteristics between riffles and pools. They're not quite as... Uh, deep as pools a lot of times, or at least, um, but they might be deeper than riffles. They're usually not quite as slow as a pool, um, but a lot of times not quite as fast as a riffle. Uh, so they're kind of that in-between water type. And instead of having an up to downstream uh, bowl shape like you'd find in a pool, their depth profile is usually from bank to bank like we'll see in, in uh, a second. But they usually have some ruffled surface that's similar to a riffle. It might not be quite as um, accentuated the waveforms, uh, but they usually have substrate that's pretty similar to ripples as well. But the, the contour pattern is different. So a lot of times in runs you're going to see your contour pattern more from bank to bank like this instead of from uh, the upstream side to the downstream side. There still can be a, a depth change from up to downstream, but it's usually not that deep bowl shape like you're going to get in the pool. So our strategy for fishing runs is a little bit different, or at least mine is. Um, in this situation, I'm going to look at it as, as three lanes here, or at least three areas mainly based on depth and or velocity. So in this situation, on that right bank, where it's shallower and slower water, I might fish a, a single dry fly or a dry dropper up that to kind of suspend a, a nymph real shallow. Um, once I get to the center, I might go to a straight Euro nymphing rig 
and make sure that my flies are right down near the bottom. And then in that far bank again where the, the current really slows down, I might go back to suspending that uh, nymph below a dry over there where I can reach over that with a Euro rig, keep my line off the water so I don't have to mend, 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 and just really hang that rig in there. Uh, those are all good ways to target some water like this. Um, at the least, you need to be willing, if you're going to fish from bank to bank, to make a rig change usually, uh, if there's a big change in depth and velocity. Okay, so uh, as far as that goes, if the run allows it, let's say the water isn't so clear that you, or so smooth that fish can just see you plain as day, a lot of times on a run this is pretty much how I'll fish it, so that I can minimize the amount of rig changes that I'm going to get. So um, you can see the overlay on this photo, uh, and essentially all I'm signifying here is that if you're fishing a run, a lot of times I make longitudinal passes up the river instead of making uh, latitudinal passes across the river. And by doing that, I can fish pretty much the same general depth and speed of water from the bottom of the run to the top of the run in one pass. Then I can come back down, go a few feet further out. But by that point, the water might be deeper or faster, so I might want uh, a heavier fly or a little more tippet or something. And so I'll fish that pass again from bottom to top. And then if the run is wide enough or it changes enough, I might come back down and do it one, one, two, three more times, or whatever it takes to cover wh whichever river you're in. Um, and that, by doing that it that way, I can make the least amount of rig changes possible uh, and still fish exactly where I want my flies on the bottom or near to the bottom in a lot of cases in run. Now, if I were to go across the river, the problem is every step that I take, I'm now getting to a different depth and speed. And so I might have to either alter my rig or just make totally different casts, things like that, to try and get my flies down, and I still might not have the best rig for that situation uh, because I'm going shallow, then deep in the middle, then shallow on the bank again, right? Whereas if I just go from bottom to top, I can stay in that shallow water or that deep water the whole time and only make you know, one or two changes instead of having to change every single time and make that cross hat pattern. All right, so let's just do a quick case study and a run here. Um, that cable that's at the top of the photo there, it pretty much split this run nicely into two. Uh, so for the top half of the run, I'm gonna, we'll do a little comparison of where we found big fish and also looking at some drift mechanics. And then on the bottom end, we're going to look at comparing rigs. So um, on that top half, we were walking from down to uh, upstream to downstream when we came on this run. And so we ended up just kind of starting right there at that cable and hitting the top half first. Um, and the inside edge, that right side, if you're looking upstream where it was shallower and slower, it was packed with a bunch of these little rainbows, just cookie cutter rainbows like crazy. Um, there were all sorts of just smaller fish in there. But as we worked across, once you get to that, that more, um, the, the water with the waves and that higher velocity in the center and then towards the bank, uh, where there was some deeper water near the trees, our second pass coming through there, that we got a lot more large fish in that instance. So better prime holding water, uh, both for refuge and for food. And we got a lot more fish that were large, like uh, those guys right there. So multiples uh, of fish like that. So just kind of an illustration there of the dominance hierarchy that you'll have, often find in a stream. If you work your way into a run, um, you're probably going to find some smaller fish in the less prime water to begin with. But you're going to work your way in to that you know, honey hole water, catching some small fish along the way that might hopefully then avoid kicking into where your prime water is and maybe spoofing some of the larger fish like this that you could get. Uh, another one that Pat got under the trees there. So one of the things that we did in this spot that was um, kind of unique, uh, if you look at a typical Euro nipping uh, approach where you're either leading your your cider uh, or your flies downstream and you have that upstream cider angle or you get totally vertical with a, trying to get a, a straight dead drift with it. Um, one thing that worked quite well in this run was what I've come to just deem the inverted cider drift. So Pat uh, Weiss, who's in the photo here, uh, our teammate, um, he started doing this, I don't know how, he's been doing it forever, but I first saw him do it uh, back in 2014. and. At first, I thought he was just crazy and didn't understand what he was doing or why. But as uh, time has moved on and I've seen him do it some more, I've come to realize that in certain situations, it's actually it's just totally deadly. 
So basically all he does um, with this drift is you make your cast, you're fishing it normal for about half the drift, and you get to the center half of the drift and you just stop your rod. So instead of continuing the drift with your rod tip down through the drift, you just stop it there. That cider gets straight under it and then it continues down below the rod and basically it inverts. And um, the weird thing about it, this is kind of what I think happens. I haven't been down with snorkel or scuba gear to see it yet, but this is pretty much what I think happens. Um, as you stop that rod, you'll get that, that bow-shaped downward uh, or downstream arc in your cider, like you can see on the slide there. And a lot of times when you see that, your flies tick bottom right then. So you would think that you're actually accelerating your drift and leading to downstream drag, which then is going to pull your flies up. But there's something about it where your flies actually travel down before they travel up. So it's a way to get your flies as deep as they possibly can go. Um, you will compress your length of dead drift by doing this. It's not going to be as long. But a lot of times you might get, I don't know, a few inches deeper than you might otherwise. And especially in colder water or uh, deeper, slower water, this can put and just hang that fly in, in the fish's face for a second or two longer in a way that you can't with a normal uh, lead drift or vertical cider angle drift. So it's a really good way to mess around. If you've already been through a spot with a few dead drifts, give it a, an inverted drift or a little jig drift, and a lot of times you're going to find a few more fish that you didn't another way. All right, so let's move on to the lower part of the run. It was, again, packed with small fish, and even more than the upstream side and in the, the slow and shallow water. So I thought it was the perfect place to compare rigs. The fishing in that part was, of the run was pretty much as crazy as I've just about seen it anywhere. Um, we, Pat, when he stepped into the run, I think out of his first two dozen drifts, he landed something like 18 fish. I mean, it was just stupid fishing. Um, and so we, I decided, okay, let's, let's put on a drop shot rig because I get asked a lot about drop shot rigs from folks. So I pumped a fish uh, to see what was in it because I brought my old tailwater box that I haven't fished with much in a long time that I used to fish on this river a lot. And it had a lot of imitative flies that I could pull from in there. So this is a quildagon, which was one of the flies I was fishing uh, before. I, or I think it was the fly that the fish ate when I took this stomach pump. Uh, you'll see it's somewhat imitative, but really not. Um, certainly not in the perfect size or shape. It's got a nice little uh, ribbed effect, kind of like some of the major lyra in there. But it's not perfect. And really, a lot of the flies that we were catching fish on were large. Uh, you'll see here in a second. Um, so I picked out a couple midge larvae, or uh, I picked out a midge larva and a midge pupa. As you can see, there's quite a few of those in this pump sample. There's also some micro stone flies and some small scuds, um, lots of typical tailwater food. And so here's what we had. Pat had the uh, pheasant tail and the waltz worm that you can see in the center of the photo. They were both size 14s or 12s, pretty large flies that he was murdering fish on. So I picked a little mercury midge and a little uh, midge larva that you can see top and bottom there and put them above some split shot on drop on droppers for a drop shot rig. And I made a whole bunch of different changes, um, messed around with some tippet, messed around with my, my number and my size of shot to try and get the rig behaving exactly the same as we had it with the weighted flies. So I was ticking just occasionally uh, the same way. Um, and for whatever reason, I went from same as Pat, having more fish or more fish on or more casts end in fish than casts that didn't. To it took me about 50 casts to catch my first fish with that drop shot rig, um, and it didn't make any sense to me. I mean, there were flies that historically in there would have worked just fine for me, but um, for, for whatever reason, with that drop shot rig, doing the same basic thing, same drift, same everything, it just was not working the same. Uh, so I ended up finally hooking a fish around 50 casts in, and what ended up happening, it ate the top dropper, that mercury midge, it made a jump, and as often happens with a bounce rig or a drop shot rig, where all the weight is concentrated at the bottom, if you get a fish that jumps, that weight fires up through the rest of the rig, and it in. It's a nice bird's nest. So I said, screw it, uh, I'm going back to a weighted rig. <laughs> And I uh, re-rigged, put weighted flies back on, and on the first cast, I caught a fish. The first cast. Um, so I don't know why in this instance that the weighted flies that were definitely not imitative and a lot larger than anything in the drift, I don't know why they were working so much more um, effectively. 
And I'm not saying that this is going to be the case all the time. I'm not saying that drop shot rigs don't work. I'm not saying anything like that. But it's just another demonstration of the reason why I have so much confidence in fishing a standard Euro rig with weighted flies, even when the flies aren't perfectly imitative of the size, shape, color, whatever. It, the drift properties are such that it just works. Um, so if you haven't tried it, I guess my message to you is try it. All right, so let's talk about glides. Um, this is the Rivnik River in Bosnia. There's a guy fishing some drives up to some rising fish and a, a nice glide at the top there. Um, glides are probably, uh, well, they're, they're flat, smooth sections of water without really a lot of defining characteristics to them. Uh, and if you look at a lot of runs, if you get to really low water, you can have runs that become glides simply as, you know, as the water drops and the, the turbulence gets lessened and the velocity does. The hard thing about uh, glides is that there's really no, you know, you can't walk up and say, oh, that's where I'm going to fish because there's a nice, beautiful prime holding line there. They look so similar across most of them that the fish could literally be anywhere. Um, so you have to pick techniques or approach it in a way where you can cover everything methodically instead of just hammering you know, one spot where you know the fish are going to be and not worrying about the rest that doesn't look fishy. Um, trout can also be very spooky in glides, so you normally need to take either an upstream uh, approach where you're fishing upstream or some sort of long distance approach where you stay away from the fish a little bit. Uh, the best time by far to target glides, uh, glides is when the fish are rising. That makes it easy for you. You know where the fish is, you can target it with a dry fly, and your glide goes from being something that looks empty to fish magnet. Um, so that's a lot of times when I'll focus on glides. But if there's no fish rising, then I normally fish these, uh, I fish glides with a dry dropper or a greased and floated cider on a urinip rig. And we're going to actually break down those two in this case study. So this is what fro floating the cider looks like. All it is is just greasing that cider and casting it upstream and you're essentially fishing it like it's a dry fly and it's suspending a lightly weighted rig. And in some glides it can work really well. In others, as you'll see, um, sometimes a, a, a true suspension rig works a little bit better. better. So this is a uh, glide. This is right downstream of the run that we just did the case, stu uh, case study on. So fishing with Pat still. And Pat is a, uh, a guy who really likes to work one liter and one rod and just do everything that he wants with that one rig. And he's very good at it. Whereas I tend to be more of a splitter instead of a lumper. And I like to have multiple rods to fish whatever rig I want in any given situation. Uh, both approaches work most of the time. Um, but in this case, I was glad that I had a different rod along with it. So we started in the back end of the glide. You can see um, this is kind of halfway through when we've gotten closer to the riffles. But you can see at the top of this glide, there was a nice riffle coming down in. And then the bottom half is just all that smooth, slightly bumpy, but smooth water, really no features to it. So Pat uh, started with his straight Euro rig. He was mostly flying, uh, flying, si uh, floating the cider, fishing upstream. And uh, as it would come towards him, once it got close enough, he'd just lift the cider up off the water and turn it into a standard uh, over and across drift if he was fishing at a quartering angle. Uh, but he only landed one fish in his first several dozen drifts. It was taking him a lot longer to catch fish than either of us really expected, given how good the fishing had been upstream. So um, we swapped, I hopped in, and I had a rod that was rigged up with a dry and a double dropper rig on a uh, Euro leader. So I had what I call a modular Euro nymphing leader um, with a fairly large dry fly that was spending two heavily weighted nymphs. So basically I was fishing an indicator rig, but with a dry fly and a Euro leader. Uh, and pretty quickly I, I picked up fish. It wasn't quite as good as it was in the run upstream, but I caught a lot. And same sort of thing happened. Uh, on the near side, in the, the smoother water that wasn't quite as good, we caught smaller fish. And then as we got towards the opposite bank, um, I caught a couple fish at first, but wasn't quite getting down. So I switched to one bead size up. I think at first I had two 2.3 millimeter beads. And I got to the far bank and chucked on a 2.8 millimeter bead, trying to get down a little more. And so then I had a bunch of these size fish coming off the bank. Um, and over there, there was a nice foam line. So whenever you see that foam line, that's always a good good spot to look for fish uh, right off the, the willows there and there were a bunch of rainbows feeding it. Now as we kept on going upstream though we got into that that water that is a little further upstream where it started to get bumpy and it transitioned into a riffle 
And all of a sudden, I went from catching a lot of fish down in the smooth tuff to not catching very many fish at all. I think I caught one or two and quite a few casts up there. Uh, so I said, okay, Pat, hop back in. And he did. And he his catch rate picked up right where mine left off. And he started hammering fish in that riffle that was coming into the top. So the lesson in this instance was match your rig to the water that you're in. If you're down in that glidey water, for whatever reason in this instance, having a longer suspended drift where my flies were kind of uh, drifting horizontally in the column and just staying there, that worked quite well. Uh, but as I got into that water that was upstream where the water was a little more bumpy, I don't know if that was the reason why all of a sudden my rig wasn't performing the same way or if it was just a velocity or, or, or depth difference. But for some reason, then the, the uh, versatility of Pat's rig definitely was king, and he ended up catching a lot more fish from then on out. So match your, your rig and your approach to the water type you're in, and you're going to be more successful. Okay, last, let's talk about some bank side lies. So I think this is the most overlooked piece of water on any given river. And if you talk to Lance about our day on Monday, we had a lot of instances where we went through some pretty darn good looking water and caught a few fish, um, but maybe not as many as we suspected. And then all of a sudden we got to a few bank side spots that really didn't look good much at all. And there were multiple you know, larger fish than we had been catching elsewhere coming out of these places just as long as we were willing to risk putting some flies in trees. Um, so bank side lies are magnets, especially when you got brown trout. So around here, we're a brown trout state in Utah, but if you're out there, you know, for those who are watching on YouTube, um, if you have brown trout in your local waters, you better be fishing banks or else you're missing a lot of fish. And rainbows are going to be there too, but especially in brown trout rivers, they're very common. And the reason why is that they offer friction from two sides. So you not only get friction from the bottom like you get in the middle of the river, but you get friction from the bank as well. So you typically get these types of seams like this, especially if you have anything protruding out from the bank like a log or a stump or even just a point of land, you'll get this inside seam where anything from there to the bank is quite a bit slower and anything from there out is quite a bit faster. So from that red line in, in this situation, produced a whole bunch of fish. I think seven brown trout came off that bank. Um, whereas we fished out in that current as well, and even with some rig changes, didn't catch a single fish. So it was an instance where the bank was definitely the place to be. So there's um, three casts that that I tend to use to try and get my flies into on the bank. Remember, uh, first would be a bow and arrow cast. Second would be a helicopter cast. And the third is a parallel kick cast. And the way the video clips have been going tonight, I'm just going to skip the video clip. But uh, you can find all three of these casts in my book. Um, you can also find uh, the bow and arrow cast and the parallel kick and the helicopter cast, although I don't think I call it a helicopter cast, in Modern Nymphing Elevated. Um, essentially the bone arrow cast, most people would know, recognize that one. You're just picking up that fly and making that bone arrow shape and shooting. And then uh, the helicopter cast and the parallel kick cast are just variations on that oval cast and doing some different things within the oval to make your flies go where you want them to go. So this is the parallel kick and I'm just going to skip that for now. Um, all right. So bank side lies. Let's look at the last case study. Uh, so this is a little spring creek uh, that I was fishing with my friend Charlie Card, um, and it was pretty cool. We got up to this little riffle here, uh, riffle slash run, whatever you want to call it, and on the inside edge where you can see that lighter colored substrate, there was some fish there that we could see, and then in the middle, right in that fastest water, there was quite a few fish as well. This is a spring creek that has both brown trout and rainbows. So the interesting thing was, I think we spotted six fish or seven fish in the center, and we caught most of them. Um, uh, and three out of the four that we caught were rainbows. So it was water in the middle, in that faster current, higher velocity, higher uh, amount per volume of water of prey items going past. So that's the type of water that rainbows tend to like. So there were rainbows in the center. But when you look on the far bank, there was a couple spots here. You see it, uh, letter, or, uh, number one there, all those nice uh, low-hanging twigs that were over the water. Um, whenever you see that, expect some brown trout because 
anytime they can get cover over their head and also a spot to hold in conjunction with that, they're going to want to be there. Uh, so in this spot, what I did, we, we'd already fished the center, and I knew, I can't remember if I spotted this fish or not. I definitely spotted the fish that was upstream. This spot, I, I think I just saw and said there should be a fish there. You can see a tiny little depression in and around that group of rocks right there under the, the branches. But you can also see in the lower left corner that boulder and then also that turbulent fast water in between. So uh, going back to your positioning again, I used that boulder and that fast water in between to break up my silhouette. I put that in between me and the fish, and I was able to get pretty darn close to that fish without it spooking. And so then I used uh, kind of a helicopter slash parallel kick cast, it was an in-between, just really exaggerated that oval, came around, and then made that, that oval continue a quarter turn, to slide my flies under those branches, and uh, put my, my flies probably about three or four feet upstream of, of that number one. I think it took me about three or four casts to finally get deep enough back in there, but once I got the first drift in that spot, I uh, had a brown trout eat right away. And this is the fish that came out of, oh, well, this is me fighting it. <laughs> but I, I used those center heavy currents. You can see where I'm standing right there. That's pretty much where I was standing when I hooked the fish. I just used that heavy current in the center and those boulders to break up my silhouette, and I got pretty darn close to it. Uh, but that's the, the trout that came off the bank there. Now, just upstream of that, um, there was this spot. And this kind of had a double whammy. So technically, this was not only a bankside lie, but it was also a lie on the front face of a rock in, in uh, pocket water. You can see that group of rocks on the left side of the photo there. That fish was just riding the wave on the front of those rocks. Pretty much had its tail on the front of them. And I could see it from the center of the river, and I could see it was a large fish. Uh, but the problem was that one single twig hanging over the top. And it almost touched the water. So I couldn't use even a parallel kick or a helicopter cast in this uh, instance because I would have had to place my flies upstream. And obviously while drifting down, my tippet's going to run into that branch and I'm, I'm done for. So the only way to get it in there was to use a bow and arrow cast. So I, I put myself diagonally downstream and pretty much shot a mostly upstream but a little bit diagonal bow and arrow cast up into it and tried to hit, uh, pretty much hit that rock with all the watercress and moss on it over there and again it took me a few casts to get it deep enough in this instance um, I was lucky in that the fish didn't spook uh, but I think on my third or fourth, ca fourth cast I finally got my flies up near that next little twig that's hanging down kind of up where the that little bay and the, where the recess and the, and the bank is there and once I did that I was able to get enough sink time or sinking distance from where my cast landed to where the fish was that my flies finally got down and do it right away, and this was the fish that came off of that spot. So, um, yeah, it was a nice big fish. It was the fish of the day. It ended up being my last fish, you know, because I think this was uh, when it was getting darker. So I said, okay, I'm done. That's one to end on. Um, but that's the type of fish that you can often expect if you are really diligent about fishing bank side lies, and the type of fish that you're going to miss a lot if you're not. Um, so. Be willing to risk some flies. One of the reasons why uh, I and many other competitors tie such simple flies a lot of times is that we expect to lose them and we expect to, um, or we don't want to cry when we do. <laughs> so, so, so I'm not gonna tie, I'm not gonna tie a fly that takes me, you know, uh, six, seven, eight, ten minutes to tie one. I can tie one that maybe is a little bit simpler but works just as well and takes me three to five. Mainly because I can tie twice as many, and that way when I come to a spot like that, if I break it off, it's not the end of the world. I got more. But if I don't shoot for it, I'm never going to score, right? So you have to be willing to swing for the fences sometimes and break off a few rigs, uh, but the reward is pretty good. So ignore those bank side lies at your own peril. All right. So if you want more, I got books up here. Um, and... I've got, uh, we've got books on my site. Uh, Fly Fish Food has books now. Um, they also have both of our DVDs. we got Modern Nymphing, European Inspired Techniques, which is our first instructional film on European Nymphing. And then there was the follow-up, which is kind of a master class level called Modern Nymphing Elevated. And actually, the, the cool part is that rainbow in that photo right there came from the same day that I shot those case studies with Pat. <laughs> um, 
So, um, if you want to learn a little bit more about European nymphing uh, specifically, go to those two videos. And if you want kind of more of the holistic, competitive approach to water, then check out my book. Thanks for coming, you guys, and thanks for watching online. And, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Devin. You guys uh, have any questions? We've got a little bit of time. We'll probably go for 15 minutes or so. So. That's a good question. So the interesting thing about fronts of boulders is, is that most of the time, once your flies get to that spot, the current does split, and it'll actually end up sweeping your flies around them. So as long as you don't have like a stick there or something for it to lodge on, a lot of times I don't even worry about it. I if it runs into the front of the boulder, it's not a big deal. Uh, most of the time, the front of a boulder has been ground down by erosion enough that it doesn't have a very grabby face, unless you're in you know, a newly fallen boulder or something. So I don't, I don't worry about it a lot. But what I worry about more is having uh, two flies and one trying to split around the rock one way and another trying to split the other way. So um, what I'll typically do is one of a couple of things. Uh, I'll fish one fly and I'll just make sure that I lead that fly right up to the face of the rock and then just kind of put my rod tip in and try and move it around the rock before it hits the face of it. Uh, if I'm fishing two flies, I normally try and um, keep my rig a little bit shallower, intentionally not let it get to the bottom in that instance, so that I have one dropper about halfway or um, more than halfway up the face of the rock and one dropper that, or the point fly that's down a little deeper. The interesting thing, if you've ever gone and sight fished places that have uh, fish holding on the fronts of rocks, a lot of times they're not down on the bottom. Many times they're holding there specifically as a feeding lie, and also that water actually slows down in that specific lie um, even more towards the surface than it does on the bottom because it's basically driving up a ramp, right? So the water can actually be slower near the surface than the, near the bottom in that specific instance. So the fish can ride that slowest spot up near the top and it spend less energy. So um, many times I don't want both of them, if I'm fishing two nymphs, I don't want them both down low. So that's when I'll make that cast, make it short up above the rock, not have a really long sink time. And then just elevate my cider a little bit so that dropper is closer to the surface as it comes to that rock. And if I do a couple drifts that way and I don't catch a fish, then a couple drifts later I'm going to drop the whole thing down and see if there's anybody down lower. But as far as running into the face of the rock, I don't really worry about it much unless I know there's a stick there, and then I'm just going to try and, once it gets to a point, I'll just hurry and lift it up and try and get it over the rock before it runs into it. When you're fishing those uh, fish, I don't know if I caught one using a dry dropper for that last year. Dog. Those last two were a straight, straight Euro rig. Oh, straight Euro rig, okay. What kind of That was January, but it's on a spring creek that is in the 50s year round, so. Oh, yeah. It often fishes rather summer-like, even in January. I mean, I I can go there in January and catch fish on Catasterize, <laughs> so or even like Chernobyl. <laughs> so it's it's a rather unique place. Um, that so I had a single on to begin with, um, under the trees, I, and then I switched to a double for that. Um, bow and arrow shot, which is normally the opposite of what you do, because you normally want a single for a bow and arrow to be more accurate. Yeah. But I just uh, the fish was riding that front face of the rock, so I wanted to split the column again. So I put a lighter nymph on on the dropper, and then the, I had that egg fly on the on the point, and he ended up taking the egg fly down low. But but uh, yeah, that was just a straight euro rig. And normally in the winter. I'm more likely to gravitate towards that than a dry dropper unless it's a really slow spot, just because the fish typically aren't willing to come up in the column for a dry fly as much. Mm -hmm. There's one from YouTube. Um, what's your approach to really deep pool, six to eight feet, um, and what would you do with your tippet? Well, um, you're going to want to extend some tippet, obviously. So, you know, uh, if you can work around the one and a half times the depth of the water rule, I suppose, and try and, and get it in that realm. Um, you're going to have to have a lot of tippet in that specific instance. Uh, you're going to probably want some heavily weighted flies, so you might, especially if they're 
taking mainly small flies for you, you might want a fly that's really quite large and put, packs most of your weight into it with a dropper fly that uh, might be smaller and um, a little more you know, in the size range that you want. So you can get that heavy fly to get the other one down. But mainly uh, what I'm going to do in that situation is work on some different angles with my casting and some different distance. So if it's six to eight feet deep, I'm not going to be able to make a 10 foot cast above where I'm fishing and expect my flies to get down quickly to that water and get a drift, right? And then be right back out of it. So the deeper the water is, normally the longer the cast you have to make uh, with a Euro rig or any other rig that you're fishing, because you need more sink time to get down there, right? So I'm probably going to lengthen out my cast Instead of casting short, you know, 10 to 15 uh, feet away, I might cast 25, maybe even 30 and pitch a long cast upstream and strip a lot of slack as I let that rig free fall. The other thing I might do is try and do a, a tuck cast. So I, I make that long cast upstream, stop the rod really high and hard and get those flies to uh, tuck vertically down in the river and try and drive them to the bottom. Uh, lastly, if I really feel like I need to, I, I will go to three flies in that situation if uh, regulations allow it, obviously. Um, you're not going to do that if you're only allowed one or two flies where you're at. But if, if regulations allow it, then I'll put three flies on and uh, pack a little bit extra weight that way into the situation. And a lot of times in water that deep, you might have some fish that are suspended throughout the column anyway if there's some hatch going on. And so sometimes having multiple flies at different areas in the column can actually be a benefit. Well, so let's say you're going back to that Euro Nymph rig again. Um, it's a little bit different for the, the dry dropper because that dry can actually stick in that slow water and kind of keep the rig there instead of sliding across. But if you have a straight Euro Nymph rig, it's going to want to continue sinking. Um, unless your rod tip is close enough that you're almost vertical over it. But if you have any sort of diagonal angle out to it, it's going to want to continue sinking. So in that, in that case, I actually exaggerate putting it beyond where I want it to be you know, to begin with. So I might put it um, quite a ways into the slow water so that by the time my rig has sunk, it's now right along the seam. Um, if you put it into the seam to begin with, as it's sinking, it's now going to come to the near side or the fast side of the seam that's closer to you, right? So um, think about, visualize your rig as it's sinking and what it's doing. If you're casting a ways away from you, it's going to come back towards you as the rig sinks and you have that tension that's kind of pulling it across a little bit. So exaggerate your cast or your, your, your placement by putting it further across and that way once it gets down to depth, it's in along that seam where you want it. And you can always work your way into it again, right? So use that near to far principle I talked about. If, uh, if you think there might be fish along the seam to begin with, or even on the fast side, which in warmer water or heavy hatch times, there are sometimes a lot more fish out in the really aggressive fast water than there is on the back side of the seam. So work your way into it. You know, land your flies on the near side first. Don't get them into the seam all the way. Make a couple drifts. Next couple, make it a few inches further and etc. until you get all the way to the bank and, and you're worried that you're going to hook up. Alright, any others? Well, boys, we're shutting her down. Thank you, Devin. That was awesome. Thanks, Curtis. And, uh, yeah, you've got, we'll put links to uh, Devin's stuff in there, so. And we're stopping.